All right, Dougie, what are we up to now? Okay, uh, I'm here with Dave Jones. We're about to sling some lead lighting around his lab to see if it makes any difference, improvement, whatever. Because so, you manufacture your own lead lighting uh, in-house as well we as import? We manufacture, we import, we design for others. Everything? Everything, the works. Because it is quite dark in the corner. There's Peter over in that corner. He's checking out my mantis. Um, it's you know it's probably darker than it actually looks. We'll get the lux meter out. You've seen a previous video I've done with this. So um, at the moment I've only got the strip, uh, two strip fluoro. So we've got some some uh, uh, LED LED fluorescent replacement. Yep. And some long LED strip current driven for the bench. Now, awesome. What I figured we'd do is baseline what you've got on the bench at the moment. Yep. I've drawn a mud map here of your side wall, back wall, bench, and the positions of these well, verticals, mm -hmm. just so we know what positions we've done Lux measurements at. We'll do befores and afters. Before and after. Okay. Let's do it. So we've got two fluoro replacement tubes. So we'll just replace this trough up here, both tubes in there. I think we'll try that one because yep. you seem to spend more time at this end of the bench than the far end. Absolutely. And we'll probably position the lead tubes, which are three metres long. Yep. Oh, roughly evenly. Uh, well, maybe pushed up towards this end of things, mm -hmm. simply because this is the dark end up here. It is. And there. Monsters. Oop. Check. Whoa, whoa. Do they, can you hold them in the. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Javelin. They're three meter strips. They're three meter strips. And these are the ones you manufacture in house? Yes. Now we can basically do these in any length from uh, 0.6 meter up to five meters. <laughs> we happen to think that three meters was about as long as we could fit in the car to carry over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we've got uh, LED drivers constant current drivers to suit these particular ones. Got it. And how much are these things going for? We haven't adequately priced these up yet, so I don't have an off-the-shelf answer for you. Got it. <laughs> oh, well, that's all right. Uh, if you want some, yeah. talk to Dougie. But uh, yeah, we'll figure that out. Look, we'll probably put it up on our website at some stage. Got it. So. Uh, all right. Okay. So we're just going to hang those from the roof, I guess. We are. Uh, we've got clips to go with those. First thing, though, measurements measurements let's do it let's get our two lux meters yep now okay here let's we have, have <laughs> let's pull them both over we have my one hung low j car cheapy and we have over here this beastie here from spur scientific which is reputed to be significantly more accurate and comes with nata test certificates excellent now <clears throat> i guess there's three parameters of a light meter that you'd be interested in. The first is how accurate is it at simply measuring light that comes direct on. Yep. Uh, as far as I know, this one's good to about one or two percent. I've got no idea what the accuracy of that one is. I have no clue. <laughs> the second parameter of interest to you mm -hmm. is the frequency response. Now, no, light meters should not have a flat frequency response. Right. Their frequency res response should be in accordance with CIE recommendations. Who's CIE? Uh, it's French for International Commission of Standards or some such. Wanky I, standards. I really All can't right. remember. <laughs> but uh, they have laid down the law with regard to what the uh, response of light meters should be, and it should approximately correspond with the human eye's response to light. Got it which means that the response should look vaguely like that, mm -hmm. where the peak is in the yellow-green end of things. Oh, this is wavelength versus, uh, mm. uh, call it, response. Yep. It tapers off at the red, it tapers off at the blue. Um, the accuracy with which the sensors in the meters agree with that curve uh, should be on a good meter specified in the manual. Got it. Uh, in a second I'll pull out the data sheets for this one and mm -hmm. tell you what that is. And of course you buy a one hung low J car cheapy and you're not going to get any of that info. They're not going to give no. you that particular specification. <laughs> okay the third parameter of interest is how the response of the sensor varies with the 
angle, angle of, of light. It. Yep. Ideally, it should have a cosine response, which means that if this is your sensor down here, mm -hmm. if it has a response of, say, unity units Got it. on axis, the response, once you go off axis, should be proportional to the cosine of that angle. So the cos of zero degrees is one, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, cos of 60 degrees is 0.5. Mm -hmm. uh, cos of 90 degrees is zero. So it should have a response that looks remarkably like that. Got it. Which is, coincidentally, exactly the same uh, pattern as the emission pattern from a Lambertian LED. Lambertian? Yeah. Please explain. Uh, to it's quote Pauline Hanson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, a Lambertian response is this cosine type response, and it's in the case of uh, LED emission, it's because your LED corresponds to basically a, 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 a hole in the universe that emits light. Mm -hmm. If you view that hole side on, Needless to say, you're going to get you, get, you, you should see nothing because it's a flat hole in the universe. Full output should be viewed there. As you go off, ang off angle, the amount of uh, area of the lead that you see becomes less and less and less. So the amount of light mm -hmm. that you get to see over here is a whole lot less than the amount of light there simply because the angle that exactly. you're seeing yep. is a whole lot less than the angle. I there. discovered exactly the same thing, of course, with my solar air heater when I was designing my solar air heater because the infrared energy from the sun, you know, if it's not at the correct angle, it you so in the afternoon sun, even though it yes, might be indeed. hotter, it might be better, <coughs> it might have greater intensity, that angle screws you. Yeah. So fortunately, with any of these things, because it is a cosine law, you can be a number of degrees off. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really matter all that much. Yep. Uh, you might drop from 100 to 0.9 to 0.8. You only get to 50% once mm -hmm. you're seriously off angle. Right. Same thing applies for photovoltaic cells. It does, indeed. You, you, if you're chasing those last fractions of a percent of efficiency, yeah, <laughs> aim them properly. Mm -hmm. If you're just after order of magnitude of pickup, well, yeah, as long as you're vaguely in the right matter. direction of the sun, you'll be right. In most light measurements for commercial installations, you only want to be within, what, 10% or something? You know, you don't really care. I can't Isn't remember. Is it that critical? Uh, for legal purposes, yes, you have to have light meters that are down to uh, sub 2%. Mm -hmm. For practical intents and purposes, 10% is probably going to be good enough. Right. There you go. But there, because in commercial lighting there are legal restrictions on how much light you need, mm -hmm. Uh, Minimum. Yes. Yep. Uh, you do need to have a calibrated and uh, preferably NATA referred uh, meters. Okay, let's go into Frog Hollow. <laughs> and you've got to get your big ugly mug out of the way too. Yeah. What does uh, what does mine say? I'm a I'm 155. I'm 169. 393. 393. Just as an aside, to the best of my knowledge, the legal requirement for uh, uh, office desks is around about the 350 mark. 485, 393, and can you remember what we got down there? It was about 165. 165 or something, yeah. <laughs> uh, down in the spooky <laughs> corner. 510 ish. Oh, should be working down that end. <laughs> yes. 510. 486, 486, you could probably edit the hell out of this later. And last but not least, interested in the bench, we don't care what it's like around the rest no, of the room. No, I don't care. No, I can switch off the lights in the rest of the room. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Right, let's talk about LED replacements for fluorescent tubes. Mm -hmm. We've seen some good ones and we've seen some not so good ones. You're overcompensating there, Doug. The size of your fluoro tube there? Well, it's a four footer. <laughs> it's a four footer, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, tell us all about these fluoro replacement tubes because they're a, so they have a sordid history, don't they? Yes. Okay, for a starter, uh, 
many of the early lead fluoro tubes just did not have an output brightness anywhere within hailing distance of a fluoro tube. Mm -hmm. Now, a standard fluoro tube, uh, well, the power input to it might be about 35 watts. Their efficacy might be of the order 70 lumen per watt. So 35 watts times 70 lumen per watt, uh, round numbers, maybe 2200, 2300 lumens. But a lot of the early ones were lucky if they put out a thousand lumens. Mm -hmm. Because LEDs going back three, four, five years ago for use in these just didn't have the efficacy. Okay, they do now have the efficacy. Uh, a typical LED not efficiency, by the way. I've done efficacy. I've done a video on that. There is a big difference between efficacy and efficiency. Yes. If you want to check that out? Look at my video. Uh, oh, just as an aside, typically the efficiency of a blue LED these days mm -hmm. can be as high as 55%. That's yep. getting on towards benchmark mm -hmm. for cream of the crop. Cree? Uh, Are there leaders still uh, in the blues? Pretty much so. Mm -hmm. uh, Lumi LEDs and a few others are playing catch-up. Um, I tend to concentrate on using both Cree and Lumi LEDs. Uh, occasional use of Nishia. Yep. Uh, once you get into the, into the lower power, uh, right. min-power type LEDs rather than the high power stuff. And occasional forays into other brands, but I tend to concentrate on those two, Cree mm -hmm. and Lumi LEDs. In green LEDs, there's not as much focus in improving the efficacy of green LEDs because green LEDs are only used for producing green light. Uh -huh. Blue LEDs are used for producing white light. White, which is what we want. Yeah, so all of the focus is on blue LEDs. So blue LEDs, 55%. You put a watt into them, you can get up to 550 milliwatts of radiant blue energy out of them. Uh -huh. Greens, 15% on a good day. Reds, don't know. I really don't know where where. And who cares? Yeah. It's red. Uh, oh, I, I care, but that's personal. <laughs> right. All right. We've dealt with efficacy on these. Now let's get into the whole wiring safety side of things. Mm -hmm. Now, you've previously talked about the wiring of a typical fluoro tube. Yep. Where you have. A fluoro tube which has got filaments and generally what you're doing is you're bringing in your active, mm -hmm. putting it through a current limiting choke into a filament there, return to neutral there and in between you're putting a starter. Yep. So that, uh, well that's normally on at startup. Apply power here, you get a current flow through the current, limit induct current limiting inductor, through the filaments, through directly through that, do not pass go, or well, actually I think that, well, mm -hmm. I'll come back to that one. Through the filament back to neutral, the filaments are warming up. Yep. This beastie is warming up. Now, I, I don't think I've drawn that correctly. I think that what actually goes on inside starters is a little bit more complex because it I is. think that what we've got in there is a gas discharge tube mm -hmm. in series with a bimetal strip switch. Yep. This beastie, the starter has a tube filled with argon. Mm -hmm. I believe that the argon tubes start ionizing at about 100 volts across them. So we have current flow through this path through that which is ionizing its head off for a, a few tens of milliseconds. Preheats the filaments through the current flowing through it. Mm -hmm. When that heats up, that switch opens, certain, opens up and if you've timed it just right, not necessarily, but uh, that is opening up a current flowing through an inductor which throws a hell of a uh, kickback a spike. Kickback, yep. Typically aided and abetted by a one nanofarad capacitor across there such that okay we've got a sine wave voltage there that interrupts we get a, a huge mm -hmm. ringing waveform voltage there which is enough to break down 
this mercury tube, which requires maybe a 600 volt spike to start ionizing. Once it's conducting, that conduction voltage then falls from 600 volts down to maybe 120 odd volts. Mm -hmm. Okay, at which point this one doesn't have enough voltage across it to continue uh, ionizing him. And it's the tube, this effectively drops out of it's out circuit. Open circuit, yep. And we've simply got current flowing down the tube and returning there. So far, so good. Ideally, what we want to do with a lead fluoro tube is mm -hmm. come along, take out the glass fluoro, and put in the LED equivalent. Not so easy. Not so there. easy. <laughs> okay. First of all, I'll show you the ideal way of doing this. The first thing we do is we pull out the starter and we replace it with a short circuit. Mm -hmm. The next thing we do and is... And you can buy those just in the standard starter package? Uh, or do you physically rip out the starter holder and short out the wires? Uh, no, the best way is uh, to remove the starter mm -hmm. and put in your short circuit. Start. So you can buy short circuit starters. They, or you just make they your generally own. accompany suitable tubes. Right. Now, again, this is ideally, this is the way it should be done, and so uh -huh. often isn't. The tube, the LED equivalent tube that you come along with, has a driver here to drive the LEDs, mm -hmm. which is powered from, well, let's just say, those two pins down there, and is equipped with a short circuit there. Mm -hmm. This means that once you've replaced the starter and plugged this tube in, when you apply power you get current flow through the short circuit, through that short circuit, into mm -hmm. that driver and return. If you're really keen you can bypass that starter. Inductor? Because, yeah, uh, so, sorry, bypass the inductor. Uh, because even though the LED tube might draw mm -hmm. only maybe half the current of a real fluoro tube, that inductor is still responsible for maybe a watt, two watts, three watts. Okay, of you watts. don't want to be pissing away a couple of watts. You could fly to the moon on a couple of fly to Jupiter on a couple of watts. You could. However, having said that, in some fluorescent fixtures, when you are doing retrofits, that can be an absolute mongrel to get to, so pff, leave it in circuit. Got it. You may also have to leave in circuit the power factor correction cap, which ought to be fitted mm -hmm. in there, uh, to correct for the, uh, with leading current through there, mm -hmm. for the lagging current through the True. original fluoro circuit. Okay, so that's the ideal. That's what should happen on a good day. Why doesn't it? Okay. Always. What we've seen is a few variants on this theme. In variant number one, they don't have that short circuit there. You can only feed the tube you've got. You, you have to dive into the the uh, the fluorescent the fluorescent uh, circuit yep. to modify it. So you're going to modify the trough itself, the yeah. wiring in the trough. Yes, you have to dive in so that you're applying your mains power directly to... Just the one end? Just the one end. Why would any idiot design it like that? Uh, on the grounds of safety. Ah, do tell. There are other variants on the theme where your LED tube has its driver in there and it's powered from those two pins in parallel and from those two pins in parallel. Mm -hmm. Okay, picture this. Hang on, uh, do you want to pause it for a sec while I redraw? Hang you on. have a fluoro batten wired up and it's got, yeah, say, that going to there, it's got a starter or a short circuit there. Okay, you've got a fixture that's wired like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So we come along with one of these tubes and somebody's forgotten to turn off the mains. Uh -huh. Okay, you get that into the tube 
wangled up into that connector at that end uh -huh. while there you're you busy holding that end down there yep. providing a lovely return path for current to ground via the ballast it becomes a serious mm -hmm. shock hazard yeah <coughs> and people have uh, to the best of my knowledge nobody has been killed but there have been a number of instances of electric shock through mm -hmm. exactly this kind of wiring. And I assume they're banned in Australia, those tubes? They are. Technically, you can't, can't import them? Yep, they are now. Right. Uh, but they were they're, for they're, sale at one point, so there's probably some still out there. Yeah, mm. yeah, there are. Mm. There's another variant on this theme whereby that driver, basically each of those four pins feeds a, oh, this is getting a bit fat, a diode, that one feeds a diode, those two also feed, you guessed it, mm -hmm. okay so the driver is driven from the positive and negative, so with a tube like this it doesn't matter which pins you feed with power. You can feed those two with power, mm -hmm. you can feed those two with power, you can feed those two with power, you can feed any pin combination with power and your tube sparks up. Mm -hmm. But guess what this also means with this form of tube, you get one end in there and you're in a position to receive a shock at the other end. Exactly. In actual fact, <coughs> yeah. in, in both of the cases I've mentioned so far, the current has to pass th through the driver, for example, in here, up through there, mm -hmm. down through there, and if we're going out that pin there, say, out through that pin there. So mm -hmm. that driver is responsible for some voltage loss, but we might only be talking about 50 or 100 volts out of the 240 available. Yep. It's still live and ugly. So that's another variant on the theme that you really don't want to see around the place. Got it. But, and, but you shouldn't if you're buying new tubes. You shouldn't. But maybe if you're buying 100 lows on eBay, it could be in for a shock, oh, no yes. pun intended. There is yet another variant on the theme, <laughs> recently seen, where in the fluoro tube, the fluoro tube is correctly wired with the driver in here being fed, say, from those pins there. We've got the short over here correctly. Mm -hmm. So far, all groovy. Doesn't matter which end you kind of get in you can't get a shock from the pins. The issue being in this case that this driver is a non-isolated type. Mm -hmm. So the leads that it's driving, but all of those leads, because this is a non-isolated driver, mm -hmm. it doesn't actually have a, uh, yep. a, There's no transformer, a transformer in, there. in there, are effectively at mains potential. Mm -hmm. The unfortunate thing is insulation between the LEDs on their PC oh, and course. the aluminium heatsink oh, yes. becomes wholly reliant on the rather scrawny thickness of oh, mylar or whatever it is on the PCB between the LEDs and the generally uh, uh, metal cord PCB. And there's a lot of surface area there to go wrong. Yes, indeed. Oh, nasty. So that's another issue you can get. And I have heard again uh, tales of heat sinks becoming alive. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I recently had some where we were measuring the heat sink live. Oh, we got in a batch of 120 tubes. Yep. And several of them had punched through. Nasty. Worse still, the punch through couldn't be measured with a DMM, which is only putting mm -hmm. two or three yeah, volts yeah, on there. Yeah, yeah, yes. It was occurring at high voltage. So you need a mega to... You got mm -hmm. it. So and are they legal? Uh, those ones? No. No, okay. No. Not in this country anyway? No. In order to comply with Australian standards, uh, apart from going through the, uh, the, how do you put it, the EMC uh, emissions and immunity side of testing. Mm -hmm. They also have to go through safety testing for luminaires. Got it. And there are specific standards for there. If you give me long enough, I'll remember what they are. I can't remember <laughs> them off the top of my head, but there are uh, test standards that they have to comply with for such. 
so. Brilliant. So that's all the types? Uh, it's all the types I can think of. There's probably half a dozen dangerous <laughs> types that I haven't yet seen and am likely to come across. Got it. Now, I will warn you, the couple of tubes which I've brought along today to put up in the ceiling are of the type with the, if you like, the bridge rectifier off each pin. Mm -hmm. So they are dangerous. We will want to be powering down the fittings before we put them in. Got it. On the upside, they are an isolated topology, so the frame is unlikely to become live. <laughs> unlikely. Well, look at, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> look at it this way, less likely than the uh, non-isolated type. Uh, Got it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, we could even do a tear down on one of these, but they are an absolute mongrel to put back together. Oh, I can imagine. Uh, yeah, they have to be sacrificial. Yeah. Uh, my dear, I think I've got some sacrificial ones back at the factory, so maybe mm. I'll bring in a few different types. Oh, there was one tube type that we actually had to write a commercial report on. Mm -hmm. They were having horrible reliability problems, apart from being one of the unsafe types that I mentioned. They also had a problem with the driver. Track clearances on the PCB on the driver uh -huh. were of the order 15 thou and 20 thou mm -hmm. for tracks that had 340 volts, volts. between them. And they were, they, were, they were bombs waiting mm. for a transient yep. so that they could explode. <laughs> or waiting for a bit of dust to settle and then arc over. Yeah. Yeah. So that was uh, one of the ugliest ones because when those particular tubes blew, it was really quite catastrophic. And because they had inadequate internal protection and fusing, they would just blacken completely along mm. a good third or half of the length and a lot of heat, a lot of fumes. It was, uh, how would you put it, a high energy incident <laughs> instead of just being favourite. Yeah. How does that go again? <laughs> As opposed to kaboom. <laughs> Where's the earth shattering kaboom? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's say we install these. Yeah, let's whack a couple up. There should be a power board up there somewhere. Yeah, well, kind of, sort of. Well, yep. a power point, I yep. think I'm going to have to take that one out, which means probably yeah. a bit of dust on the... Uh, yeah. Dust on the equipment. Yep. Oh. There we go, we got it. Okay. Which means, if I'm lucky, that that will turn things off. Yay! Hey, there we go. So now we can get into these. <laughs> oh, I hate these bastards. Yeah, they're a pain in the ass. Tight as a nun's nasty. Yeah, you've got to uh, lift the trough up to, and then slide the tube out one end. It's oh, 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 that's ridiculous. Yeah, the troughs are a bit dodgy. Now, in these cases, we can take those out and save them. Oh, suck me with bilge pump. <laughs> Okay, Chuck's a leady one. And our new LED is going up. <laughs> yeah, that's if I can get it in. Okay, that's one. If your fluoro batten is fitted with high frequency ballasts instead of good old 50 hertz, no. 60 hertz magnetic ballasts. They're good old magnetics. Yep. You can tell that they've got high frequency ballasts because they won't have starters. And if you're not aware, the reason they... Uh, wee, there we go, we're up. The reason they use power points for these things is so that when they build these buildings, the... Uh, uh, just the regular uh, grunt contractors can install the lighting. You don't have to have an, a uh, sparky in here. One so. of the things that we'll do is, even though that looks fairly clear, we're yep. going to give that little wipe over. They're a real pain in the butt, those things. Okay, but that one's settled. Hey! Okay. It doesn't look like the same colour temperature. It actually looks like a lower colour temperature than what you've got up there. It does look like it's this almost certainly will not show up on camera, but hmm. these these are all 4,000, which I, I thought, installed. I thought you said these ones were 5,000. Oh no, sorry. I'm mistaken, they are 5,000. Now we're installing those uh, hangers for the lights, which we're going to hang them from the ceiling so we don't have to alter the ceiling in any way. 
And mama. <laughs> okay. Now we'll leave that off for a second. We'll do a quick lux measurement right out of these than out of our fluoro tubes, but right. our fluoro tubes were not sparkly new ones like you got. I've got the quad <laughs> I've got the quad phosphor, the uh, new technology quad phosphors, so which actually probably have an efficacy that's getting up into the 90 plus lumen per watt region. Yes, they mm. would be well, they are the duck's guts. So yep. uh yeah. So those aren't going to be that great. But we'll take some measurements, we can yeah. and we'll put the other ones it back. It should be actually pretty much on parity. Okay. It's actually what? gone up to 540. 540 here? Oh, actually call it 535. 535, wow. <laughs> That's surprising because it looks dimmer. It really does. I response possibly to the lower Yep. Because uh, it's certainly a different colour temperature. So. Okay. Um, Want to call that 515? 515. It is more. <laughs> but it's but the the color temperature is really disconcerting. That's the uh, Okay, 415. Mm, yep. Still more. And in Frog Hollow, uh, 171. Ah. Oh, smidgen. Half yeah. a bee's dick it went up by. Okay, so bottom line is though we've dropped consumption from 35 to 40 watts per tube down to mm -hmm. 17 watts per tube. Brilliant. Meh. No pun intended. Uh, in each of these tubes, mm -hmm. we've got five 600 millimeter lengths. Right. Each 600 millimeter length has eight leads, basically wide and series parallel, to present four leads worth of voltage drop. Mm -hmm. So with the five strips, we've got a total uh, stack height, if you like, of 20 leads worth, or around about uh, at three volts per lead, about 60 volts. Total. Right. We're going to be driving that at 350 milliamps. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's around about 20 watts per length. The efficacy of the leads, uh, well, each lead at 350 milliamps has an efficacy of, oh, I think it was about 97 lumen per watt or something like that. Because we're only running them at 175 milliamps per lead, the actual efficacy is going to be much close to about 110 lumen per watt. So 20 watts at 110 lumen per watt, we're probably looking at 2200 lumens per strip. If, we, if we wanted to, we could drive it way harder than that. Efficacy would slip some but the amount of light would be horrendous. Well, we don't want a horrendous amount of light. Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> That's your business, horrendous, yes, amounts, horrendous of light. amounts of light. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, let the hanging commence. Okay, these particular strips were designed for a local Australian lighting company, Opal Lighting, which have been already used with uh, considerable success in one of their installations at an energy conscious college <laughs> somewhere up north near Tamworth or Taree, I believe. Cessna. Right. Cessna. And how many per strip again? Because there's the joining connector. Yep, joining connector. Eight leads per strip. Mm -hmm. Here's the next joining connector here. And is that probably the limit of how long you can make the board based on the PCB panel? I have been told that there are uh, companies not in Australia there who are. can manufacture strips up to 1200 millimetres in a single pass. Mm. Uh, that's pushing the friendship in physical handling in yep. the manufacturing process for mm -hmm. doing the SMT loading and soldering. Oh, absolutely. And you're probably paying a premium for it too, so you're introducing all those problems. You may as well put make them the limit of a regular panel so anyone can manufacture it, stick a yeah. connector on and... Yeah. Yep. As it is, these have been uh, locally loaded and assembled and mm -hmm. they've done a damn good job of it. Terrific. Uh, Rams Onyx, same place that you got some of your PC. My done. microcurrents assembled, yes. Just so. We've but had mate, a bang. Yeah. Very wide, right? Yeah, it's, it's a... It's definitely gone splatty around well, there. Well, it's a top brand. It top, shouldn't top fail. Band, top band, yeah. Uh, top band. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've actually done a fair bit of work with these guys. Something gone horribly wrong. 
Okay. Tear down! Because it was a significant bang. Yeah, that was. It might have uh, tripped the uh, circuit breaker on the bench as well. Something, All right. something click. No trace of anything nasty there. However, ooh, definite trace of something particularly ugly. Oh, there. oh, well, that's huge, oh. Charin. Look at that. Oh, dearie, dearie me. You want to you, you know what's happened here? What's happened? The PCB has been inserted incorrectly into the plastic. Oh no. So what we've done is apply the mains up the output. <laughs> we plugged it in back to front. In effect, yes. <laughs> in effect, there's only two ways yeah. to wire it up and we got it. Well, no, hang on, I'll, I'll show you what we made for a second. Oh, this is hilarious. That's quite right. Aha. Uh -huh. You can see by the topology. You can. That that is obviously where the mains should go in. Uh -huh. so that's where the EMC filtering, bridge rectum and switching device are. This is the output side where... So what actually blew? The, the cap didn't blow there, uh, did it? No, the output sense resistor. Oh, there we go. Is, is that all? Yeah, that's all. So if we crack it open, we can see that it sits in the base on... Some, there's no slots in the, oh yeah, there's a slot in the PCB no, there. There's, yeah, there's a locating yep. slot. There's a locating there's slot. There. So that sits in there like that. And, but it was in. No. No? No. It was in the base the right way around. Right. But oh, the top was. Yeah, the, the top, top is was symmetrical on the base. The top is put on like that instead of like that. Like, actually, like that, that instead, instead of. of like, like that. That. Because there's the mains input here, because you can see the topology, of course, as we said. And that's some serious charring down in there. That's just nasty. Very, very nasty. Look at that. It's really fried. That board is just one of these, um, it's not like an FR4 um, grade fiberglass board. It's one of those crappy phenolic base ones. So I'm surprised the cap didn't blow. Uh, there you go. There wasn't enough energy on there long enough. The sense resistor ruptured before it could do any upstream damage. Yep. Mm. That's what it was supposed to do. But all that, just from the lousy sense resistor. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It's a hell of amount of energy. Well, it's a large component. It's got rather a lot of magic green steam in there. Yeah. Uh -huh. When components rupture, the magic green steam comes up and blackens the surroundings. The That's larger it. the component, the more green steam it's got in it. I thought the green cap would have had a whole that, bunch of it. Oh, they have even more green steam, but it's harder to let out. <laughs> <laughs> and there we go. We can see some beautiful close-up destruction there on the board. You can see it's just absolutely fried. There would have been what, a whole bunch of flames uh, shooting out no, of it. Just no, a just a single blast. Single blast. Yeah. And people wonder why we talk about multimeter safety and all that sort of stuff, you know. If you're holding, if you were holding this, if your hand was around there when uh, this thing went kaboom, then uh, would have could have been quite serious. You probably hmm. would have copped a thermal burn, not a shock. Yep. Now I'm just wondering how much of that is Yeah, bit of spit there. <laughs> yep, there you and go. a lot of that is simply plated on carbon. Yep, from the blast. Yeah. <laughs> and how does it smell, Doug? Like victory. <laughs> <laughs> I love the smell of charred electronics in the morning. Okay, so we have left over. All right, <laughs> we one, one death lead. <laughs> we have. Reset our circuit breaker and ta-da, we have. And that's kind of what they should look like. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, aesthetically, most people would not like looking at. No, you wouldn't want to widely, look at them. Widely yep. diffused uh, or wi widely spaced leads like that. Point source leads, yeah, yeah, no. But once you get them up in a ceiling, casting light without mm -hmm. the necessity to, without the necessity to look at them or once you get them behind diffusers they're marvelous so now we're hanging them up on these 
hangers that uh, just well, hang, go figure, from the uh, tiles up there, or the uh, metal strips oh, between the tiles, so you don't have to modify. Rotate them a little further. Uh -huh. Anything? I plug and play first. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Let's plug it in. Uh, okay. Yeah. This is rather interesting. They are definitely 4000K. Incidentally, with, yeah. a, with a color rendering index of 82, they are claimed to have a, uh, a color of 4000K, but it's actually probably close to about 4200 odd figure mm -hmm. compared to the 5000 5, down there. 5000 down there, yeah. <laughs> Done. Okay, now we're going to have to come back to put the second one up because we need a new driver. <laughs> oh, that's Revise embarrassing. The measurements. <laughs> there has to be a kaboom. Unbelievable. Uh -huh. Unbelievable. I'm, I'm going to be writing an email to them. I, I know already they are going to be horribly, horribly embarrassed by the whole thing mm -hmm. because <laughs> they, they are a mega big company and they take pride in what they do. As you would with a name called Top Band. Mm. Why aren't they top brand? Did they forget the R? Uh, no, they because they kicked off in life manufacturing automotive components and have diversified into all kinds of lighting product. They make cameras, uh, you know, like CCDs, mm -hmm. GPS systems, uh, a lot of different kinds of lighting, including induction lighting, got which it. is rarely seen in Australia. Okay. We're up. We've got our two strips installed. And we've got our new LED uh, uh, replacement fluoro strips up there. What are we reading? 298. 298. So yeah, practically full hollow. We started out at 165. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we've almost doubled. Well, spot oh, on 600. Try 725. Oh, 725. Smashed it out of the park. Almost good enough for surgery. Not quite. Okay, 845. 845, get out of here. We started out at 485. <laughs> and that one is, well, if we get that out of the way, oh, 725. 725. So here we go, here's our final figures. In the bench over in the corner, the darkest part of the lab here, 165. And we went up to 298. That's actually almost legal. <laughs> <laughs> You're almost allowed to do paperwork in the corner. Right. That's almost 16. <laughs> All right. We started at 393, which is my main soldering area. That's what we started out at, which is pretty, you know, 400 is probably yeah. adequate for that. Jumped up to 725. Go figure. And the peak is in my te over, over my teardown bench here, which went from 485 to 845. Woohoo! And then it tapers off down here and down near the MakerBot. It's shielded, and we think it's tube warm up yeah. over there. Going which... from 282 to 304, yep. that's probably simple warm up in the fluoro tubes. Yep, yeah. that's probably it. Awesome. Same with this increase, 486 to 540. Yeah. This area is probably Get a getting a bit, bit of overspill spill from, from the tubes up here, yep. but not a lot. So there you go, you've got enough work to do proper electronics with. One of the things that you have to remember is that your vision tends to have a roughly square law, mm -hmm. or, sorry, square root law, proportionality. If you go, you have to go four times as bright, measured, yep. for it to be roughly twice as bright as, In, as perceived. As, as you perceive, yep. yep. So let's say you increase the brightness by a factor of two. Mm -hmm. As far as your eyes can see, you've only increased it by a factor of 1.4, 40% mm -hmm. brighter. Yep. So that's why measured numbers here, even though we've roughly doubled a lot of those brightnesses, yeah. your perception of that it doesn't is isn't, not as high. isn't as yeah doesn't really correlate. It's also coloured and flavoured by colour temperature. Yep, of course, oh. and of course what you're used to as well. Yeah, it's a mental thing. But probably what you are going to find yourself is when you do start work, is suddenly going to realise oh. I'd have had to have put a, an extra <laughs> light. light here to do this. Exactly. I don't have to. Oh, cool. Sweet. Yeah. And they look pretty groovy hanging from the uh, strips there. We will replace the uh, tile. Yeah, I was about to say, once the tile's back yeah, up there, they'll the be almost aesthetic. Yeah. 
There you go. I might even cable tie them up the clips or something, you know, be all yeah, wanky and... Yeah. Route, route the wiring proper yeah. like. And, yeah. 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 I like it. <laughs> Thanks, Dougie. And you can catch Doug at Doug Ford Analog Design. I'm zooming into your little logo there. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> dfad.com.au. He's got some cool stuff on his site. Check it out. If yep. you want LEDs, he's the man. Yeah, we've even got uh, little bits and pieces to sell too. Awesome. Thanks, Dougie. <laughs> See the web shop. <laughs>